Hey everybody, welcome to this session with my friend Jeff Greenwald from Fearless Tennis. Really excited to uh, have him on to help us uh, transform our mindset and, and play loose under pressure. So uh, first off, uh, thanks so much, Jeff, for coming on. And uh, how have you been? It's been great. Thank you. Great to be here, Marvon. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Same here. And uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, I guess we'll just get started by asking you, uh, uh, you know, kind of a general question. We'll go from there, which is, uh, and by the way, everybody say, say hello and where you're from in the chat. Um, why do people get tight in the first place? Like what, what are the, you know, physiological, physiological or, you know, the mental factors that, that, that create tightness in the first place? Um, well, um, what creates tension? Um, there, there are a lot of things that, that do. So physiologically, um, the, we have a little uh, part in the brain called the amygdala, which, you know, keeps us alive and keeps us from walking in front of buses. And, um, but when we're on the tennis court, that, that part of the brain, the amygdala kind of gives us that fight or flight freeze uh, scenario. So when you think about what's going to happen, winning or losing, How's it going to go? Then, then uh, the the body, the cortisol kicks in, and we feel like we're in cement, and our arms get a little bit rubbery at times, and doesn't really want to finish that uh, follow through, does it? Yeah, 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 hundred percent, hundred percent. Let's see, say hi to a couple of people here. Frank B from Oklahoma. How are you, Frank? Great to see you. Lefty Seven. Hello from Nevada. I'll I'll take a guess that you play tennis, Lefty. <laughs> um, and. Uh, I guess um, from your experience, uh, uh, Jeff, uh, can you tell us about maybe a time where you got really nervous uh, when you were playing a match and then uh, talk about like some of the steps that you took to uh, to help with that situation? Sure, sure. I, I you know, I don't know if folks um, with uh, with Peter uh, Freeman uh, heard this story and maybe I, I told this before, but sometimes, you know, the these moments are so dramatic that it's hard not to to share um i've had many and, and i know many listeners uh have as well and one in particular was was uh i guess in 2019 in la jolla in the finals and i don't know if folks know my background or not Marabon, but either way i was in the finals of uh uh sorry semifinals of the 40 nationals and i was playing um uh, francisco clavet who had beaten federer and Agassi twice back to back. Hewitt, he had a pretty good resume, and uh, I was playing him. Uh, I won the tournament the year before, um, and I was down um, two love, forty love, and I hadn't won a point yet. Mm. And I look, I in my mind, the the score came. I, I saw six love in my mind that I was going to lose six zero. <laughs> that, that kicked in some nerves there. The, you know, and a hundred people there watching. And, um, and so I had a, I had a moment there where, you know, a lot of anxiety, uh, nerves, embarrassed, you know, it was sort of embarrassing, right? And I had, I was shaking returns and immediately I went into a, mo I, I went into a productive place and I visualized my forehand being loose visualized you know how i wanted to kind of go from there it was a juncture and i chose to use my forehand and um and work the point and um you know let the anxiety come through me channel it through me let it come through and release so releasing the shots instead of holding back what happens a lot of times is that tension gets stored and we of course nine times out of ten play it safer right we hold back so it's this releasing of the energy, letting it go through the ball. That's a bit of an you know, act of faith. But I did that. I won 7-6 the first, the first set. That was good. Um, I did lose in three sets. But it was a great moment of turning something around that was quite um, you know, challenging in the moment. And I, I was going to say you know, to, to folks who are listening, because I think part of the problem is you know, we often think you know, the anxiety, the nerves, the tightness, you know, we're alone out there. We're the one. We're the only ones feeling it. And uh, Novak said he's never played a match that he didn't feel anxious. And I would say the same that I've never played a match where I didn't feel some tension at some point 
uh, that you have to work through and manage. And it's all about managing it and being able to, in many cases, even turn it into something productive. And that's part of what I hope we can get to today is how can folks do better with this feeling, these thoughts, this experience of, of worrying about, of course, how's it going to go, you know, in the end. So, yeah, yeah, 100 percent, 100 percent. I just want to say hi to a few more people. Um, John, hello from sunny Victoria, B.C. Just got back from a match where I poached so much based on a previous live session from this week. Fantastic. Love to hear that. That is so cool. Um, yeah, great. Uh, good job, John. Got to, got to put what you learn into practice. So you're doing a great job. Um, William, good afternoon from Northside Sports Group. Hello, William. Great to see you. Uh, Jay, look. Hello from MoCo again. My fellow MoCoer. Um, it's in Maryland. Uh, Garrett from Boston. Hello to you. Um, excellent. Uh, I've already got some questions. Fantastic. So we'll put one up, uh, if that works for you, uh, Jeff, uh, John, how do you handle the pressure coming from your doubles partner comments, et cetera? Hmm. Yeah. Um, comments, yeah, you know, the, the, how about this, the classic, you know, you're missing your first serve, missing double faulted maybe a few times and your partner says, just get it in. Just get it in. Thanks a lot. You know, like, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, the client, just get it in. Okay. Thanks for that. But, it, you know, obviously part having partners who some, some may, may just be an eye roll. Um, you, you know, body language, you can pick up on it. And certainly, and there's partners who try to teach you, you know, coach you and tell you to, what to do, which is, can be very irritating so, uh, for, for, for people. Um, uh, you know, some cases it's like marriage, you know, how much can you accept from your partner, you know, if they're trying to, and how much can you let go? But it is, a, um, it certainly, um, talking to your partner is, is, is good, you know, uh, to do say, you know, that, um, let's keep it positive. Uh, let me, I'm working some things out. If you need to set boundaries, basically just like in any relationship to say, I, you know, I need some, some time to kind of get my game back and, you know, partners, you know, who, who don't, you know, support you and aren't positive that, that that's uh, you might want to find somebody else perhaps, but they, they need to learn. And I think ultimately we do need to let people know what we need and what helps, what doesn't help. And if you, especially if you play with them reg regularly to have that conversation, say, I really love when we stay positive and give each other a chance to, you know, permission to miss. And, you know, so we can, you know, take some good cuts at the ball and, you know, early on even, and just to get, get the game, you know, get your game going. But, Either way, I, um, I think ultimately we have to keep, you know, stay on our side of the court. We have to manage our, our mind, our, our body, our nerves and, and not get too, not let our minds get caught in, in our partners too much easier said than done. I know, but, um, th those are some thoughts. Yeah. Great thoughts. Appreciate that. Um, let's see, we got Gary. Hello from sunny Phoenix. Excellent. Uh, hello to you, Gary. Uh, Garrett, I get the tightest on this serve slash toss. Are there ways to calm the nerves and stop overthinking? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so huh. the overthinking and, um, it, this is, this is really important because the serve, especially, and I can't tell you, Maribon, how many players I'm, I'm working with. I mean, including, you know, number one at Stanford over the years, uh, uh you know, pros on the tour who, who have the games on their serve or, you know, they're, um, they just get tight and the serve ironically is the one shot we initiate, right? We have full <laughs> control over. <laughs> and, and because I think a lot of, you know, because of that and, and that we expect to be able to control it. And when it goes off the rails, it, it can be, we go into a place of overthinking maybe we pull out two or three different tips, you know, in your head, you're thinking I should reach up and bend, bend the knees and, and there's too much going on. So I think, uh, you know, there's a lot to say about this, including how you practice and train, you know, um, um, a loose arm is very valuable. So, so learning how to exaggerate that feeling of being loose or even a toss, if that's the, the thing you're really focused on, but you want to keep it simple have one cue and not more, not more than that. And I, ideally it's more of a rhythm on the serve as opposed, you know, sort of the whole motion. When we start getting it, picking one thing um, that can be a slippery slope. So it, you know, some people may find that, you know, really exaggerating with the arm up and, you know, even 
you know, that helps to, to, to get that toss up there. Cause I know the toss can drop um, really reaching up. And so, you know, every player has to find their personal cue that, um, and I, ideally it's sort of, again, a rhythm from the beginning of the kinetic chain from your legs all the way up to the, the, the contact, but which I've had more value. I found more successful in getting that rhythm right, as opposed to picking at the one or two things. Uh, so, um, and, and then learning to be present, you know, which we can talk more about here in this time that we have is how do you actually stay in your body? Uh, don't let uh, yourself go into that Rolodex of, of tips or et cetera, but to stay present, use the bounce of the ball and the routine can be very helpful. A uh, feel the ball actually bouncing and you need to direct your mind essentially to something productive and because otherwise the mind will go to different places, often unproductive. So redirecting, refocusing your mind to something relevant is very helpful. A lot to say on the serve. We could probably talk for hours about it, right? So, hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I always tell people that, um, you know, one of the best in-between point routines uh, or things to do that, and I always credit you, I always say Jeff, Jeff Greenwald told me this is like feeling your feet on the ground. Um, that's yeah. that's a fantastic one, really, to refocus yourself. Um but uh, Jeff, we already have uh, we have a lot of questions here, but I was I mean, what you think we'd want to go to the uh, the doc at this point and then go through that and then more do more questions or do you want to do questions now? Yeah, I'd like to do the doc and then let's come back to questions because I think the document we're going to go through will clearly map out, you know, alternatives that, that for people to then think about and, you know, more questions, the better. Uh, so let's do that. Yeah, perfect. All right. So um, I can't see the full doc there. Are you going to expand that? Yeah, let's see if I can uh, expand or uh, and if I can make it scroll. That's fine, too. Either way. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah. OK. Hopefully that's big enough. Yeah, that's good. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm on 20, my 23rd year of, of working um, with with players on on their mental and emotional and um, approach to matches and, you know, essentially how to be in a tournament, how to find this state, this, what I call them uh, dimension really, um, how to play in this place more often. So this course, this, this talk today is about being tight and how do you get looser? Let's, I want to look at this from two perspectives. One is, you know, if we can have the mindset that actually, um, decreases the tension and increases the feeling of, um, you know, positivity and positive energy, you know, before you even walk on the court or as you walk on the court, as you're warming up that because your mindset is cleaner, let's just say it's cleaner, the dash or the windshield on the car is cleaner. You will be let, you'll become less tight in general, and you'll become less tight even in the big moment. So I just want to first address that. Then we can talk about, well, how do you deal with the times where you do get tight? But if we can look at this together real quick, um, what I did is I, I sort of broke, um, I broke this down of, of the differences in mindsets, essentially, that we have a choice on how we begin to approach matches. Outcome is really why I am still in business and and and. and there's no end to that. People are really, really um, eager. Of course, we're all we'd all like to win. We don't. We'd prefer winning over losing. We don't know what's going to happen in any match you play. Uncertainty is the thing that the you know humans we don't tip we don't typically like uncertainty. So, because of this outcome, it, it's an exciting game. And but what happens is we tend to look into the future rather than being present in the moment. Mastery. There's two tracks here outcome mastery when um you know that we're hoping our opponents miss so follow me here hoping right you guys know what what i'm talking about versus playing with intention very big difference huge opportunity playing with intention purpose protecting against errors right trying not to miss big deal human instinct versus permission to miss permission to miss is both the process and the outcome of a mastery mindset. When you ha give yourself permission to miss, you only need to win 51% of the points, as we know, maybe even 49 and you still win, right? So we've got to give ourselves permission to miss. 
easier said than done. It's something we don't, we're very stingy, which, but there's a statistic here. We don't need to win 90% of the points, right? I used to think we did. Um, we play tentatively under pressure, right? Often tentatively safer, backing off the ball, backing off the return, not following through. You guys know what I'm talking about. Versus committing and being more aggressive or assertive under pressure. It's controlled aggression, but nevertheless, you're going, you're leaning in. You're not going back, right? High expectations. You want to, you know, beat the people you should beat, you know, and, and you go in expecting this and that when really you need to go on the court, not with no expectations about the outcome. You don't know what's going to happen, but you're committed to the cues and the intentions that you've set. It's very stressful in the outcome rather than really enjoyable. If you enjoy what you're doing, you're having fun, you're going to play better. It's risky, feels risky in the outcome versus challenging. You're playing the score, you know, you're up 3-2, 30 love, so you feel a little better. You're up 40 love, feel a little better, down 40 love, you know, and we let the score drive the car. So I'm really big on playing on your terms. What does that mean? That's what I do with folks, right? What does it mean? And uh, and not, and still using the score, but not not playing, not letting the score control us. Uh, in the outcome, we tend to um, uh, you know rely, you know think about how others are going to perceive us. Very big deal. How are others going? What are they going to say if we win or lose? Right. Versus playing for yourself, having the satisfaction of playing your game, hitting the shots that you know you have, and 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 really committing to that. Lastly. We, we doubt the outcome because we don't know what it will be. We can't predict it. We can't control that 100%. Um, but we can trust the process. We can trust the process. So you need a process that helps you get into the mindset here, mastery, that helps you focus on what's relevant. And then you're going to be less tight. You'll be looser, uh, more focused, and you'll be able to adjust more, period. That's that mindset part. We can talk. Marbon in a bit about uh, what do you do when you get tight, but I just, maybe we could get some questions on this and then move pretty quickly to what do you do when you're out there and you're starting to feel those nerves? Yeah, this is great stuff. I'm trying to scan to see if there's any immediate questions about this one. I mean, there's a lot of just general mental game sure. questions. I guess, let me ask you um, one thing about this. Like, what do you, what would you say are like the top two, uh, ones here that we get wrong the most that we're on on the right side instead of the left side. But right. um, so the number one um, doorway, if you will, uh, the, is the protecting. So I would say number one is protecting, um, which is certainly overlaps, of course, with playing tentatively, right? Um, and I would say... Um, as far as mindset wise, um, it's a toss up between and related again, the high expectations, the expectations of I should win. I, you know, they're ranked here. They're rated here. I should win. Um, six letter swear word in my, my book. And then, um, and then, you know, what other people are going to say if you win or lose. So we have the other, the sat the, uh, being, um, sort of, um, having our attention and, uh, motivation be um, based on what, what others think. So I'd say those are the three top three then, uh, you know, aspects of outcome that hurt you. So permission to miss, committing to hitting through the ball, being, you know, following through, um, uh, and which, again, overlap the expectations and, and then, um, uh, you know, really playing for yourself, playing on your terms, right? So that 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 really can put you in the driver's seat of the car. As a, I use an analogy a lot, I think it's a good one, as opposed to putting you in the back seat of the car, maybe even the trunk at times. So, yeah. Yeah, this is a lot of good stuff. And, and everybody, um, if you have follow-up questions about this specific um, document here, then uh, definitely let us know in the chat. Uh, I know we have a lot of different questions here. Um, there's one with, did we cover this one? Do you find it easier to play as the underdog? It's funny that you asked that, Chris, you know, uh, I, I have a couple D one teams I'm working with and, um, 
and and one college team in particular, they're really trying to emphasize the underdog mindset, and it, it, because it helps them be hungrier, you know, as a team, they're kind of going in, and even in some cases, sort of exaggerating that underdog mindset. Um, I had a, another player say, but uh, you know, they. Well, you know, they didn't, couldn't fake that or whatever, but the, I think the underdog, you know, aspect takes it to where you feel like you have less to lose. Um, and that being said, you know, underdog, it's, it's still interestingly part of the outcome track here on the right. So, un, you know, underdog is like, who's going to win. And, mm. and, and so, I, I just believe in going in and being very defiant, stubborn, committed to some of the things you see on the left here in mastery that um, because then you're playing um, for something that's, uh, you know, you want to win. That's a given. You want to get to your destination. If we stay with the car, you want to get to Palm Springs. You want to get there. Of course you do. But how do you want to enjoy the ride? How do you want to be on the way? You know, do you want to be loose at the wheel? Do you want you, are you going to grip the wheel really tight? Are you going to, you know, be a little looser, you know, with, with an enjoy the journey. And I, I just, um, so underdog, you know, favorite to win seated one, not seated. It just kind of creates this, this roller coaster emotionally, I think, and mentally, you know, not everybody can certainly do this, right. It's, it's, um, I think it's, um, it takes a lot of, uh, I think it takes some reflection and managing your ego and realizing that while winning is cool and, and, and you do get respect. Um, uh, but then you're at the next tournament and the next one. So the irony, Maribel, and lastly, is that when we, when we're in the green over here, when we're doing more of those things, we end up winning more anyway. So the, uh, you know, all these different ways it's, if there, it's an outcome door, I think in the end, you're not going to reach your potential, in my view, if that's where your mindset is. Underdog, overdog, should win, shouldn't win, whatever. You know, let's get into mastery. Got it. Perfect, Jeff. Thank you. Um, so I did see a question here about the document. So Frank asks, when you say process, what are you talking about? So what I'm talking about is I'm, um, I'm returning serve. So the, my, the server is walking up to the line and let's say I'm in process. So I'm feeling my feet on the ground, feet are connecting with the ground. I'm in my body, not in my head, right? Feet are furthest thing from your head. So I, I feel the grip. I have a quick visual of, um, you know, if I need to, an adjustment, I have a quick visual of, you know, moving the guy around, going to the backhand. So just maybe the tactical adjustment if needed. Um, uh, and then I focus my attention on the ball as they're bouncing the ball and I'm committed. I already know what I'm doing. You know, I'm going to lean in, hit through the ball, no matter what, pretty much go down the middle on the return. I have four things that I just mentioned that I am attending to. I'm attending to, um, it, it, you know, juxtaposed to I'm standing, I'm there waiting to return server comes up my head i'm thinking uh it's 5 3 30 15 god if i wish won that last point you know and uh you know it'd be i'd be up 30 15 and i don't want to go three sets i'm not in the best shape right now so um oh geez there's there's you know my doubles partner watching and you know you feel oh god i'm a little tight I feel like this is all within seconds you know you feel tight yeah. you're on tight and, and you just actually don't feel like hitting through the ball, right? All of a sudden. So your mind, you're now focused on the, the nerves a little bit. Um, and so that's the, the, the process is what are the cues? What are the things that you're going to attend to that are going to help you perform? Yeah. Love that. Love that. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, just a lot of questions here. Really appreciate all that participation. Um, let's see. Uh, Frank, um, you looking for a usable strategy to combat my nerves. I get so mad at myself for not being able to overcome them. The gap between my practice level and play level is huge. Thanks. It's a yeah. common one. 
Yeah, well, Frank, I just want to say you're not alone by any stretch. Uh, you, uh, you would be perhaps surprised at how many people share this, so including at the highest level of the game. Um, and, and so, look, the, the tendency here with nerves is to want them to go away, to wish they would go away. So acceptance is a crucial part of it. Do you want the nerves? No. Um, does it feel good? Not at all. Um, but if you're, you recognize that you have some tools that you're developing and you're developing confidence in, in what, what I'm about to share with you, you're, you have a place to go. You have a place to go as opposed to being mad that you're nervous, then you play tight, and then you're frustrated that you played tight, and by the way, you lost the point as well, or maybe even worse, and this is gonna sound weird, but you play tight, put the ball in the middle, you know, ball hits the service line, ground stroke, short ball, you, the opponent um, shanks it, misses. You know how that, those sitter balls are. Nobody loves those sitter balls, and he, you know, he had all the time in the world, he misses, you got, you got away with it. Frank, you got away with that, right? And if you got away with that a number of times, you're going to play tug of war with yourself. Should you hit through the ball, finish the stroke, or put, just kind of, you know, abbreviate that swing, get the ball back in the damn court. But they will miss sometimes because it's it's a slower ball. So you've been reinforced and you're not going to then commit to your shot. So that comes back to playing on your terms. Um, so overcoming nerves, it's really more about management. It's about accepting embracing the challenge. I know this is all mindset there, but also you have to train yourself to remember the feeling of what it feels like to follow through. You, there you are, you're tight. Uh, you feel that, you know, your tendency is to back off. So you have to double down, as I say, but you can also visualize the feeling when you're in practice, when you're hitting baseline game or rallying, what does that forehand feel like actually? Not thinking. What does it feel like when you're in practice? Can you feel that sort of looseness in your arm hitting through the ball? Picture that two seconds in your mind, that feeling, you know, by the way, smiling can help a lot. You know, I talk about in my book, smiling to expand your perspective. You smile, it releases serotonin a little bit. So you've got the breath, maybe smile, visualize. Uh, these are options, right? You don't have to use all of them, but maybe something will click. Uh, visualize that feeling of, uh, of of releasing on that ball, like in practice, you know, um, and and commit to that, and don't get mad, don't get frustrated when you miss it. But if it's a twenty percent better than the last time, that's a win. It's not going to be loose, you know, completely loose. But if it's better, you can build on that, and and you have something going, and that the managing your nerves becomes the thing, as opposed to God, you know, I'm down five, four against this guy and his, you know, I'm better than him. Damn it. This here I go again. That's outcome. And that's not going to kind of move the needle for you in your game. A long, long response. I've just been down this road so many times, Frank, I hope that's helpful to you. Always feel free to reach out to me as well. I'm happy to help. I have a course as well that helps you, you do this fearless tennis. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely check out fearless tennis. Uh, great stuff, Jeff. Really appreciate this insight um, let's see. Rosie. Hello from Georgia. Hello, Rosie. Uh, hope you're well. Um, Baron, uh, Neil from, okay. So Neil from Boston, how do you balance being relaxed with too relaxed and use a slap at the ball? Great question. Great question. Uh, Baron. Yeah. So, uh, I was hitting with a player yesterday and, um, we were, so I have a, a loose dial. I have a dial. It's, it's about muscle tension. Right. And so, so it's, uh, I call it the loose dial. And the lower, the better. So a, a three, four is looser, more relaxed. It's, it's you on your best day, fluidly hitting through the ball without worrying about the outcome, right? Um, think of Federer on his best day, you know, pretty loose. Rafa, more, a little bit higher, more like a five or a six on the dial. So 10 really tight and uh, one really, really loose, right? Two loose. Um, so as you train yourself, um, to recognize the difference between a three, four, which is pretty nice. The four is pretty nice. A six, seven, eight is going to feel very different in your arm and your hand as you hit the ball. Uh, a seven 
which a lot of players are really, believe it or not, and, and you may find this too, Baron, that you're, you're at a seven, you know, your grip, your tension is hitting the ball, the muscles you're recruiting to just, again, this protection, this over controlling. So loose means releasing on contact, right? So you train this in practice, you train hitting at a three or a four and just feel the feeling of that hand and arm, nice and loose, finishing it. And then you, then you go to a seven, you know, just contrast that with a seven eight, tight, really tight. And then drop back and do, do 30 seconds at each, you know, maybe six shots at each, right? Six shots at a four, six, six at a, at a seven to juxtapose it, contrast it. And you start to see and feel the difference between these. And these numbers are just good to start to get a, a metric for, and a feeling like, oh yeah. So in a match, you could be like, where are you? What's going on right now? Where, how tight are you? Oh, Jesus, you're like, a, you're like an eight. You're gripping. All right. Remember that feeling of a three, four, because you've practiced that too. It's not just a thought. You have actually feel that a little bit. And it's going to help you 20, 25%. And that's a win, as I said. You're not trying to just be loose and be reckless. It's not about that. And it's not about the backswing being all loose. It's a normal backswing. But when you make contact, you're releasing through the shot, through the ball a little bit more. So that loose dial can be super helpful. Again, I have that in my course as well. Awesome. Awesome. This is great stuff. Thank you, Neil. Great question. Um, let's see. Uh, Kubi. Hey, Kubi again. The concept of just think about the next point. How do I block out the fact that you're down 4-1 and not have that pressure affect your game? Easier said than done, but how do you do that, Jeff? Yeah, so you don't want to block anything out ever, really. I mean, mostly. Uh, you know, if you're good at that and you can slam the door, you know, as you get better with your mind and ability to manage, you can shut the door on, on thoughts and so forth. No question. But sometimes or often those thoughts will come back because you, you're really creating this resistance to, to the thought. You're not okay with it, right? So you're down 4-1. Would you like to be up 4-1? Of course. I mean, but guess what? You know, and as a kid, I couldn't do it. I mean, I didn't know there was ways to deal with this, but <laughs> if I lost a point, I felt like I should win. I was thinking about it for, for a game, you know, and losing a couple games or a set, it would last for a while. But I mean, so you don't want to block it out, except that you're down 4-1. And again, if you have your process clarified, you know that, you know, you have, you, you have a routine, you can feel your feet on the ground, looking at your strings, you focus on them, but you have specific things to put your mind on, right? And you're in, in, and it's never over till it's over. I mean, like what game, what sport can you be down 6-0, 40 love, have not won one point and win the match? I mean, think about it. We are so fortunate, although it makes people crazy too. But but think about the actually the there's no no clock. So while you say you know four one down, it's like is that just one break? How many times do you see people come back from that? Are they thinking about the score? No, they're like okay. Not to mention if you're down four one, now you have less to lose anyway. And if you win one game, certainly two your opponent is starting to freak out. Let's be honest. You're up 5-0 and they win two games or vice versa. Your opponent's starting to get in their head. I promise you. And they're going to start feeling tighter. It feels like if you are down 4-1 and you win one game and certainly two, they're going to be tighter than you are. So, you know, I think we often, Mirabon, forget about our opponents and what the drama they're going through, you know? Yeah. 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 They think we think it's all about us, but the other, you know, the opponent has nerves and other things going on. Right. Um, yeah. hundred percent. Uh, let's see, Christopher, tell us your mindset serving love 40 and serving 40 love. Hmm. Great question. I love that. It's funny. I was talking yeah. to Joel, Joel Drucker, you know, was a, a couple of years ago. Yeah. He brought up this idea and he said, Jeff, he said, so what do you do at 40 Love serving? You know, 
what are you, what serve are you going for? You know, you're going flat. You're going to go down the T or you're going, you know, take off pace serve. Um, and, you know, it's really tempting. And it, ha- it was for me to want to go big on that 40 love. I got room. I got permission, you know, insurance policy of 40 love to go big. But the probabilities, the stats on going bigger are not great. And what actually, and by the way, if you, I don't know your first serve and your speed on it, but if you go bigger, cause you got the room to breathe, if you will, and you miss it. And then you're, you know, they can go, you can go down the rabbit hole, you know, pretty fast. I think with, in various situations, I'm big on playing, um, you know, the, the, maybe it's a three quarter serve. Maybe it's a, it's a solid one at the body, but, but we tend to like use the score, I think overuse the score and, and just, you know, so it really depends on you. It depends on how you're serving in the match. Are you serving, is your first serve on uh, what serves working well? I mean, you know, so we do get into like, um, you know, is their forehand return good and their backhand, they're slicing a lot. And, and <laughs> what's your, do you have a forehand to back up your serve? So there are some variables here, right? But uh, I, I don't, um, I'm not really big on playing the score, to be honest. And Brad Gilbert and I had an interesting podcast a year ago or so because Brad's really, you know, he, he likes to play the score a lot. And, uh, and I, I kind of move, my needle is down more on playing your game on your terms um, and, you know, certainly playing their weakness, but um, uh, not overusing the score, um, uh, which I think can get us more anxious than it can facilitate better performance. I have found mm-hmm. at most levels. Mm-hmm. Great insight there. So, so let me ask you, um, Jeff, uh, and you know, obviously we'll get to as many questions as we can, but uh, I mean, what is really the key then to playing loose, um, you know, under pressure when you're tight? Yeah. Um, so there's a lot to it. Um, and sure. to, to, I guess to simplify um, simplify it is um, if if you can a win when you're tight that helps if you you know where and if you uh, begin to move the needle on playing more on your terms and hitting through the ball when you're a little bit tight and you um, find that to be valuable meaningful to you to hit through the ball even or especially when you're tight it creates a a sense of inner confidence because you're now no longer a victim of the nerves. You're no longer a victim of circumstance. So it's sort of like when you win on a bad day, the confidence Mm -hmm. grows. And, um, and so, uh, and the other really, really crucial aspect is that a, everybody gets tight. Everybody worries. Everybody does think about winning and losing to varying degrees and frequency. But if you can interpret the feeling in your body a as not always bad uh, or never bad, so before a match, before a tournament, some people, of course, are thinking about it days ahead. But if that those butterflies and that tension and is um, doesn't mean a prison sentence for you, right? It's that you think of it as it's energy and you're excited. You care about that. You love tennis. You're passionate. So you're kind of fortunate. I know this may be out there for some, it, you know, it's a privilege to be nervous, you know, and, and feel that um, it means that you're working at something you care, some, care about something. So, and that, um, and then learning to, manage and channel that energy differently than letting it just get stuck in you. So I'm, a, I'm big on let's release that and let's train that feeling of releasing it, get that awareness in practice, like I mentioned with the dial. So those are just a couple really, really crucial things. Interpret the nerves as not as, as good as, as a privilege maybe. And then to, um, uh, to practice the feeling of being loose physically not just in your head, but physically, um, and then really commit to playing on your terms. And um, lastly, 
if you're taking notes, I hope you are, put your attention on to something relevant uh, outside of yourself, on a target, on the strings. Um, but to get your attention off of yourself, right? And in my course with Craig O'Shaughnessy, we talk about, you know, we, we, we talk about getting your mind into, into a task of tactic, into the target. And so I think that that's a crucial aspect because when we get nervous, we get self-conscious and you want to do exactly the opposite of that. Get your attention off of yourself and onto your target and how you want to play the point. Love that. Love that. So good. Uh, let's see what we got here. Um, oh, yes. So, Bruce, being Canadian, I frequently tell my partner, sorry. I have this uh, problem, too, that I try to stop doing. Uh, when I make a mistake, social mm -hmm. habit, can you, yeah. can you suggest a replacement comment I should use instead on the court? Yeah, no, it comes up a lot, Bruce. Yeah, um, you know, and, and it can get really crazy. Right? Sorry, 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 you know. Um, mm -hmm. And... and um, occasional sorry is, is, it's etiquette and, you know, it, it just tells your partner, Hey man, sorry, you know, and I'm um, doing my best. Um, but I, I just would try to, you know, it's like, just don't do that. Right. You no, know, like cut that, cut out, cut smoking off and don't do it. But how do you quit? That's a, you know, how do you quit any habit? But I, I think the, um, the, so, oh, you know, doing the sorry thing, it's sort of, if you think about it, I mean, if you really go deeper on it, when we think about permission to miss Maribon, you know, like mm -hmm. it, it's a, it, it's really not a permission to miss there. And then, I don't know, your partner, you know, isn't getting the message that it's okay. But if you're okay with missing, if you give yourself more permission to go swing away and poach and do some of those things, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to make 10, 15 unforced errors. You're going to, and, and you can still win the match. Right. So, I think that you just, you know, take a breath, smile to yourself may, and even go to your partner and tap rackets or fist bump, even when, especially when you make a mistake in doubles, I think it's even more important to fist bump and high five a little bit or something. You see it a lot, you know, you keep that positive energy going, even when, especially if your partner misses too, to sh give them the feeling of permission to miss is say, no worries, you know, no worries, you know, and again, come together a little bit of contact somehow. We're not in the hard, hardcore COVID now, so maybe you, you can fist bump, tap them on the arm, we're not getting there. But, mm -hmm. you know, so yeah, I just think that's important to, to have that chemistry uh, and giving each other that permission as best you can. Yeah, I love that. Love that. Thanks, uh, Jeff. Uh, a lot more questions here. <laughs> uh, John, is it better to ignore the score and try to play every point the same, or can you channel the pressure of the score in a positive way sort of what you were talking about of of your philosophy versus um you know pros and whatnot uh, oh sorry versus craig was it who was that that you were mentioning that had the different philosophy than you on that oh brad brad gilbert yeah, brad, that's right he yeah. used the score quite a lot and and you know for some people uh, that works really really well and um you know uh and so it's a matter of I think your game and how, how varied it is. I'll use the score just to give an example, John, like if I don't serve in volley a lot, I'm a, I'm an aggressive baseliner. I'll come in a few times a match for sure. I want to do more of that, but, but um, you know, if, if there's going to be a play that I want to, I really want to do more of, and I'm up back to the point of 40 love or 30, 15, and I'm in a pretty good spot. It's also going to depend on how I'm feeling, but a little bit, but um, I'll, uh, maybe I'll serve and volley at 30-15 as opposed to love 50 or 15 all. I'm, I'm going to probably do the serve and volley at 30-15, 40-15, um, you know, to mix it up a little bit or maybe take a risk I wouldn't normally take if I've got a little bit of room there. But um, so uh, it, the tactical uh, choice I'm making would be re um, related at times to the score. Um, I do believe, John, that um, – that playing the points, uh, you know, finding out, you know, figuring out, of course, where is your opponent weakest, which wing, forehand or backhand? A lot of times it's the backhand, right? Not always, but how do they do with, pre you know, pressure coming? I, I am a big believer playing your game, and you're going to get a lot of value out of playing your game, whatever you define that to be. Um, but then, um, uh, 
you know, and really, really using the process that I've been describing to stay focused and loose. I believe if you're focused, loose with good intensity throughout the match and not adjusting and in your head a lot, you know, not overly adjusting and in your head constantly, um, you're going to play really well. You're going to play better. And the score, in my view, goes from being in the dashboard of the car to the trunk of the car. You're not going to forget the score. But I think playing with the score in the trunk of the car, backseat at the most, is a better play than playing with the score on a GPS where you're looking at it all the time. I don't think that's va uh, va uh, very helpful for you to squeeze all the juice out of your orange, in my view. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Love that. Love that. Thanks, Jeff. Um, uh, Rosie, how do you handle the partner that asks what they could do better at the end of every game? Hmm. If I'm watching all her shots, I will definitely have a decent game myself. Hmm. Interesting. Um, that's, that's interesting that they're asking. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that, um, you know, let's keep it simple. I mean, she may need help. Um, he or she, I'm assuming she, but, um, you, I'll definitely have a decent game. Yeah. Yeah. But, myself, sorry. But that just to keep it simple for, for her. So I, uh, again, coming back to the intentions here, number two, instead of hoping you play well, hoping your opponent misses to have intention have intention going into the match. So your partner helping them with, you know, picking two intentions going into the match and you can do the same or you as a team can pick two intentions, you know, meaning, you know, permission to poach or uh, permission to really swing through the ball and um, uh, to uh, be more aggressive and come into the net more. And so um, maybe do if, you know, it's clear that they're dropping their head on the volley. If they want that kind of instruction to really, you know, be firm on the volleys, whatever, but that you have these two intentions going into the match. I like players to do that, to come back to when their mind goes over to outcome. So your partner's worried, a little insecure. I, I uh, introduce the concept of why don't you pick two intentions going into the match and what could you focus on now that would really help? She needs to keep it simple. She's definitely overthinking. So you might want to help her with that. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, Christopher, how do you prevent playing several poor points in a row from ballooning into a landslide? Hmm. Hmm. Several poor. Um, so this is where um, I, you know, I have many players who say, gosh, I didn't even realize I was thinking about this or that, or I didn't realize how tight I was, or I didn't realize for like, it took me three games. I was down three zero before I realized and all that. So I'm big on awareness, Chris, like getting more aware of your body, more aware of when your game goes off. It's probably because you're too tight, probably lost your focus, uh, you know, and so bringing your focus back. And and so you got to be more, you got to prioritize your focus a little bit more. Your your focus probably went off and probably maybe judging the last shot, thinking of the score, all places that are not going to help you play better. So it's going to, you know, uh, you'll keep playing, you know, you'll, it's like, oh, bad day, you know, missing that forehand and you get tighter. It's like, what adjustment do you need to make? So ask yourself the question, um, what would be productive right now? What do I need to adjust? What's happening right now? These are questions. Feel free to write them down. What's happening right now? What do I need to, which dial do I need to adjust? Loose focus or intensity, right? Um, so yeah, uh, you just need to be more aware to catch it earlier. Gotcha. Gotcha. Great stuff. Let's see. Artie, uh, hello from Iceland. Thanks for your excellent, very informative presentation. We're enjoying and learning a lot. Great tips. Great to hear that, Artie. Fantastic. All the way from Iceland. Uh, Frank, so when you say process... Oh, so I'm sorry. We actually did that one. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. Joe, what tips that can be done on the court to manage stress, i.e. deep breaths, sing a song, etc.? All Got of any them. songs? Got any songs for you, Jeff? That you sing? There's a t well. I used to swing, uh, sing Bruce Springsteen, Born to Run. Oh yeah, yeah. Big yeah. Points that yeah. We talked about. I mean, you know, having a lyric can help some people over thinkers, especially even on the serve and big points. Big points. Are you getting caught in just throw out a, something random and because you know you don't want to be overthinking and you know and we tend to get too self conscious. So 
yeah, I mean, that can work sometimes, especially if you have the yips, you know, a, a lyric can help, um, you know, and um, so you don't get caught into thinking, you know, about the, the shot, something you already know how to do. Deep breaths are good. I find a lot of people don't breathe properly. So they like, ah, the deep breath, yeah, do that. But then I'll say, can you show me the deep breath? And they're, you know, big chest breath. And so you want to you have that diaphragm um, expanding when you breathe in. The, 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 the stomach comes out as you're breathing in and you get better at that. You get good at it. You do it in the supermarket. Do it in the car a little bit. Do it on, when you're walking around. As Maribon mentioned, feeling your feet on the ground, one of the signature sauces that I, I have that people love. And so you kind of do these things which fall into the concept of mindfulness, being present in your body, recognize when you go in your head, come back. And so these things you practice off the court. So when you're in these moments, it's just, it's more automatic. It's a little more natural. You're not like pulling out the deep breath and you hadn't, you know, and you do it the wrong way, which by the way, if you breathe improperly, your amygdala and your brain says, Oh crap, you know, there's danger, danger, you know? Um, so you just want that belly breath, diaphragmatic breath to be, be trained and get, you know, it won't take long. You do do that for a couple of weeks. Um, on my website, I actually have a six minute, uh, deep breathing fearlesstennis.com. You just go, you know, practice that deep breath. So yeah, smiling is a huge one. Okay. Smiling is great. Um, you know, just think of something funny or just smile. And then lastly, I'd say, look up at a tree, you know, get yourself off the court a little bit, your focus, you may be getting in the weeds too narrow and caught up in the score and people, what are they going to say? Get your mind, look at a palm tree wherever or, or look at a spot on the, on the curtain. If you're the East coast, uh, Find something, uh, the hum of the air condition, like, you know, there's things like that. And ultimately, I want to lastly say, I know we're going to ra wrap it up here, but, you know, if if the worst thing that's happened in, in the last hour is a couple forehands long, you're down 5-3, if that's the worst part of your day or week, your your life, you, you are doing very, very well in your life, as we all know right now, so... Um, you know, just keeping so gratitude, of course, is also a, an elixir when you're angry and nervous and freaked out and pissed off. Uh, gratitude, you know, coming back to that for, for, for a little bit can can be useful, you know. Yeah, 100 percent. Yeah, shoot. I can't believe it's six already. Uh, Jeff, so I assume you probably have to go like very soon, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can yeah. wrap it up here in a, in a minute. I'm happy to take another question or so. But yeah, got to got to roll in a bit. OK. Yeah, yeah I hear you. I hear you. Um... Okay, Sriram, uh, great session. Glad you enjoyed it. W why is it that you play the best when you're behind how to overcome this? Is that always okay. the case? Um, not necessarily, but a lot of people, of course, do talk about certainly yeah. uh, being looser. And because you guess what? You've moved from the outcome column there over to, you know, basically at this point, you, have, you feel like you have less to lose because the worst case is happening. You're down 4-1. And, you know, so the thing you've been fearing is losing and, and not playing well um, and, uh, and what that might mean, you know, at your club or so forth. But, but when you're behind, you know, you're like, OK, I've sort of been exposed to the worst possible outcome here. You know, it's kind of what I thought could happen. I'm here. I'm alive. You, your brain thinks you're going to get, you know, eaten. But you're down 4-1. It's, you know, let's let it rip a little bit. I have nothing to lose. So you, you let go and. Uh, and, and, and you and swing freely and it feels pretty good. Your opponent might get a little tight at that point. So it's never over till it's over. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, cool. Uh, last one is how do you separate play on your terms versus play the score since scores are an important part of the game? So if I'm going to play on my terms, I'm going to use my forehand inside out, inside in. I'm going to hit about 70%. Rosie, I'm going to hit about 70% of my forehands in a match, singles. Um, and I, you know, we could talk doubles too, but singles, I'm going to, that's what I, if I'm playing well, I'm going to, hit, you know, use my forehand 70% of the time. I'm going to run around, hit that forehand. Um, and um, I'm going to step in on that return, Rosie. I'm going to step in, I'm going to commit, I'm going to follow through. My uh, part of me doesn't want to. Part of me wants to back off, hope for the best. You know, maybe put a little more topspin on it. Um, not that that's bad, but I don't want to do it out of fear. If it's a tactical choice, that's cool. But so um, 
playing on my terms is leaning in and cracking that return, hitting a good return, following through it, right? Um, not, not abbreviating that swing, you know what I mean? So, um, but, so if I'm 30 all, 15, 30, 30, whatever the score is, I'm not going to change it. I'm not going to back off because, uh, you know, 15, 30 or 15 or 40, 15. Like it, I'm going to step in. I know where I'm hitting that return and that's what I'm going to do. So it's commit commitment. Yeah. Commitment. Fantastic, Jeff. Well, appreciate that. I know you have to go, um, but can you let everybody know, obviously we, we talked about um, fearlesstennis.com, but any, uh, I mean, where would you like people to go to check out uh, all your stuff or any, any other places as well that you want to shout out? Sure. Sure. Well, I, I um, have a blog newsletter that I've historically done for many, many years. I, I got off track. I'm writing a lot these days and I do, you know, I'm, I'm moving toward a book, another book, but my first one is the best tennis of your life. If you don't know that, but um, I'm going to begin writing again very soon and you'll get a free newsletter at fearlesstennis.com. You can sign up and you will get a free newsletter there once a month or so. Um, and um, there's two courses there of uh, my fearless tennis course, which is these three dials that walk you through video, audio, worksheet, and action items for the week, right? It's an eight week course. Um, I'm on the court as well, talking about it. And then Craig O'Shaughnessy, uh, a good friend and, and amazing tactician, as you probably know, worked with Novak. We did a course together, strategy and the mental game combined. How do you make those decisions on the court in the context of a match? So that's on my site as well and our courses. So I'd say fearlesstennis.com is a good place to go. And, and please reach out to me if this was helpful or, uh, any anything yeah here uh, was useful for you on the court and tough matches. Um, I always love hearing uh, you know success stories, breakthroughs, etc. So awesome! And how should they reach out to you, uh, Jeff, if they want to? Jeff at fearlesstennis.com uh, would get to me, and uh, and and that would be probably the best way to do it. Yeah, fantastic. So I put those links in the uh, comment section about uh, fearlesstennis.com and Jeff at fearlesstennis.com for the email. So. Uh, Jeff, thanks a lot. It's always a pleasure having you on. I'm sure we'll, uh, you know, link up again soon and make some some content. But uh, thanks a lot for all your expertise. We got some really nice feedback from it. And uh, yeah, great stuff. So appreciate your time. And thank you, everybody, for watching as well. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Take care. Thank you, Mirban. Bye-bye, everybody. Pleasure. Thanks.